artists here will teach us to listen to those clues that the uh, artist so um, magically unfolds as they go through the concert, so we can also go along with that journey. There's also uh, um, another aspect of this that the artists are aware when there are keen listeners in the audience. There's a transmission from the listener that goes to the performer, which energizes them to give way more, and then the result is simply magic, and we're all fortunate to be part of that magic. We have three eminent musicians here today to guide us on this journey and offer their perspectives. They have each spent decades honing their craft across various time zones and seasons. I say that because today's session is all about rags and ritus, rags and seasons. Just like the clothes we wear or the foods we gravitate towards or the activities we are involved in with the change in season, there's also changes in music. Have you noticed how certain melodies during certain seasons seem to enhance or intensify the season. Why is that? Why are certain rags associated with certain seasons? That's what we're here to learn. Let's go along with them on this guided listening session to get some of the answers to those questions. It's also apt that we're having this session right when we're ex experiencing the beginning of spring. No matter how crazy and rainy the Californian spring gets, <laughs> so it is spring. Let me introduce the artist before we get started on the listening session. First, we have Srimati Shubhangi Sakalkar. Shubhangi started learning Hindustani vocals at the age of 14 in Mumbai, India. After training with Srimati Kunda Vaishampayan, Dr. Prabha Atre and Padma Talwalkar, Shubhangi went on to receive her master's degree in music from Mumbai's SNDT University, where she ranked first in her class. She packs so many subtleties and nuances into her music that you simply experience her music differently. You just know that the phrase is special, but you have no idea how she achieved it, or why such a simple phrase sounds so heavenly. As a student, I can attest to how impossible it is to reproduce what she does. For her, music is about creating an atmosphere that is unique to the rag. She says you must respect the rag and let it say what it wants to say without you getting in the way. That for you, ladies and gentlemen, is Sri Shubhangi Sakokra. Next, we have Sri Prasad Jogalekar. So I did similar intros last year, and I was searching through my email, desperately looking for Prasad's bio. And I kept looking for Jogalekar as J-O-G-L-E-K-R, and nothing came up. And I'm like, man, I don't want to disturb him. And then finally I sent him a text message and he goes, okay, this is my email. Make sure you don't miss the A. It's J-O-G-A-L-E-K-R. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, okay, this is why. And then he goes, there's actually a dancer on the East Coast who's also called Prasad Joglekar without the A. And he's already mad at me because people <laughs> come and play the sitar. So... <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you'll notice throughout this event that all three artists also have a right sense of humor that they wield expertly, just like they do with their alaps, sargams, and thans. So, be on the record for that. Now, let me introduce Sri Prasad. Uh, Dr. Prasad Joglekar started learning sitar from Mr. and Mrs. Bhartke in Pune, uh, starting at the age of eight. Later, he became the disciple of legendary Ustad Abdul Halim Jafar Khan. He's also learned raga music extensively from Mahar Parana Maestro, Pandit Partha Chatterjee, and has been mentored by Ustad Shahid Parvez for the nuances of Gayaki Am on the sitar. He also holds a PhD in computer engineering. Like all of that sitar stuff wasn't enough. <laughs> Prasad is both a musician and a scientist technologist. So when you put the two together, there's alchemy. He brings his keen computer engineering background to bear on why listening is important. He uses concepts from AI, artificial intelligence, to explain why it is important. Your neural network, in this case our brain, is only as good as the training data you give it. The higher the quality and quantity of the training data, that is the music that we listen to, the better the model it forms in your brain. And we are able to listen and interpret music better and use that to become better musicians. Next up, we have Sri Nachiketa Yakundi.
Hailing from Dharwad, Natiketa Yakundi was initiated into Hindustani vocal music by his parents. His formal study began in Madras under Sri B. N. Sinha and later under Sri B. Hanumantachar. His rigorous and extended pedagogy came under the virtuoso Padma Bhushan Pandit Basraj Rajguru. Nachiketa has performed in several cities across India and North America. He is a resident of the San Francisco Bay Area and he runs Rajguru Sangeet Vidya Niketan School of Music. Nachiketa's temple bell-like voice rings with resonance and clarity. He also has a smiling countenance throughout his concert, no matter whether it's alaps or thans. As a listener, you are riveted by his voice and are also invited to smile along with him throughout the concert. For Nachiketa, listening dis demands discipline. He believes analysis of the music adds to the enjoyment, and he also believes that film music is a great complement to instructive listening. Now, we move on to the segment for why we are all gathered here. I will let the artist introduce uh, the first piece that we have. Uh, before that, a quick intro about the artist that we are about to hear. The first artist we have uh, queued up in our recording session is Ustaz Bismillah Khan. A legendary artist whose name has become synonymous with the Shehnavi was a devout Muslim, but he performed at both Hindu and Muslim ceremonies and was considered a symbol of religious harmony, something that's so relevant in this divisive world that we live in. Mm. As a little boy, he came to Varanasi. I was in Varanasi last month, and um, it's referred to as the city of learning and burning. So as I was walking the streets of Varanasi at twilight, I could hear there was, there was a house that, with a door that was open just a crack. And I could hear the Tanpura. I could hear Saregama Padhanisa in Rag Bhairav, a guru's voice, followed by a student's voice, ringing really clear despite all of the noise and din that was around us. I peeked inside, and there was a student who was seated opposite his guru, playing the Tanpura faint in the dwindling light. I was so, so happy to hear this lesson in, in the middle of uh, Varanasi. If this is what I experienced in 2024, you can imagine what the city must have been like in the early 1900s. So much more intense than the arts. <clears throat> so back to the Ustad. He came to live with his maternal uncle, Ali Baksh Vilayati, and he learned to play the Shehnai from him. Ali Baksh used to play Shehnai at Kashi's Baba Vishwanath temple. At a very young age, he had learned various rags from his uncle. After the death of his uncle, Ustad Bismillah Khan played Chennai several years at the Vishwanath Temple. He also has this unique honor. After declaring independence in 1947, India's first Prime Minister, Jawaharlal Nehru, hoisted the tricolor on the red fort and invited Ustad Bismillah Khan to congratulate the people by playing Chennai. On 26 January 1950, on the occasion of India's first Republic Day, he also performed Rag Kafi from the red fort. To this day, his music is played during the Republic Day celebrations. Over to Shubhangi to introduce the piece that we're about to listen to. Okay. Um, um, as uh, some of you know that um, he's uh, one of my favorite artists and in Shehna is my is most favorite musical instrument. So uh, this particular piece um, that we have chosen is because uh, it is a, his play. He plays Rag Basant, and um, and you know you cannot see, but we see uh, like flowers <laughs> back. So it's it's the spring, and uh, um, so uh, this you will really uh, enjoy this piece. I would like to mention before you listen because last year when we did the event, some of uh, my students told me that they uh, while the, while the music was playing they couldn't get get it what was going on and then after that when we spoke they could not remember what what happened <laughs> so uh, for, for bismillah khan's music is is very very simple um, it reaches just reaches your heart directly and um, it's uh, because of the perfect soul and uh, you know the each artist has a relationship with uh, music and, and, and his relationship is very, very special, I always feel. Um, and uh, in this uh, rag, especially when he starts, just listen, it's, it starts very like majestically. And when he goes to the high sa, uh, the, the volume and the, the treatment of uh, the swars, especially 
those who understand music, Madha, Lisa, the Madha always so softly he plays. And um, that, I, I love that. And um, you want to add anything? Yeah, to her point, the Shahna is such a soulful instrument. It's inherently so suited for means or slides between notes. And Bismillah Khan just absolutely takes that to a beautiful extreme. Notice in this rag, this piece specifically, how he treats the two mas, because the two mas that are in Basant, he so easily goes between the two mas and the transition is just beautiful. So watch out for that. Now, uh, coming back to the uh, technical part of it, if you made chat GPT or multiple, uh, you know, some multimodal model to make, you know, listen to this and tell me what's unique about it. The model won't be able to tell you right now because mm -hmm. it's missing the metadata. It's, it has the data, but it doesn't have the metadata. Now, what's the metadata about? Mm -hmm. So, now here's the, where we come to my conspiracy theories. <laughs> <laughs> so, if I were to design that system, I would design a hash function. <laughs> so, so if you see in case of Basant, if you place a mirror at Tivra Madhya, yeah. you will see the image of the Purvanga into the Uttaram. Oh, okay. right? And I use that same trick to keep uh, Puja separate from uh, Sony. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? So, so if you think of, because there is no rag that uh, has neither Madhyams nor Panchals, that's one of our We have to have one of the two Mas, one of the three nodes. Both Mas and Pur, you cannot have a rag that omits both Madhyam and Panchal. Mm. Which means that you know, a lot of rags you'll find that symmetry. Mm -hmm. uh, in this case, it's self symmetric. So you'll find the structures that exist in the uh, higher part of the octave also have an image in the lower part of the octave. And I think Ustad Bismillah Khan is a master of creating structures. So if you if you find those structures that it creates, they're optimal in certain ways, and you can actually show that. Uh, but something to keep in mind when you listen to the next pieces. So, you know, so, so, a lot of rags have that type of symmetry. Uh, if you if you if you think of placing a mirror on it, uh, you know, on, at on either Madhyam or Tivra Madhyam or Pancham, you you'll find those structures. Interesting. Thank you, brother. Um, my question to Nachiketa, putting you on the spot here. So, what is it that's special about this rag that associates it with this season? What What is your perspective? I, I know there's no absolute answer to it, but what do you think is the association? I think it is the two months. Okay. To me, the treatment of the the approach to the Shuddhama Sahama that I think is, I don't know, it signifies a change of season, mm -hmm. maybe mm -hmm. heralding of a new era. Uh -huh. And the the subtlety that lies between those two Mars, right? So this is this is spring season, maybe in California also, mm -hmm. where the <laughs> it's not extremely cold, not extremely <laughs> warm. So that 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 subtle in between. Okay. And, and Basant really straddles that beautifully. So what is... Go ahead, you were going to say something. Yeah, yeah, I just want, want to add uh, some um, something that um, I always uh, have uh, noticed that, uh, you know, there is a Rappuriya Dhanashri and Basant. They have identical notes and the, um, the Maga is, is a very... Um, uh, I can't see that skin. <laughs> and if you change the ma it completely changes the mood. The maga is so happy and like uh, in Puriya also it has the maga. It's very majestic and a happy rag. Puriya Dhanashri, uh, it's <laughs> suddenly the mood changes. Otherwise, the Madhanisa, all the notes are same, but the 
the basan mm-hmm. <laughs> just uh, always uh, compared these two yeah. <laughs> rags and uh, again uh, this uh, particular uh, piece uh, when uh, usually when uh, you sing or play uh, um, the high saab he always sing loudly and mm-hmm. he, here he always plays it so softly mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. there's no no need to you know it's high <laughs> yeah. Yeah. how they uh, think and um, so that's always mesmerized me. Yeah. Did you have something to add? Uh, well, yeah, maybe I'll just, uh, they'll talk about the artsy stuff, I'll talk about the technical <laughs> 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 Okay, so if you think about Sony and Basan, Uttara, only one note is different, right? Mm. They were. But still there's so much difference in the mood and that's because if, if I were to design a system that recognizes stars, I would create a cryptography like hash function where one note change here or one bit change here creates a lot of change in output. Mm-hmm. And I think our brain does that. It stores that hash as a metadata along with the data. Uh, so one note change lights up the whole different mood, whole right, different part yeah, of it. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. Right? That's, that's what we do for cryptographic hash functions. Mm-hmm. So uh, we are not only with doing pattern matching, we are not only matching the data, but we are also matching metadata. And we are also doing some quick search and pattern match. So, you know, all of this I can relate to a system. If, if I were to design a system that can recognize <coughs> the beauty spots in a piece of music that's played, that's what I would do. I would mm-hmm. capture these things. But uh, so many others have punch No, no, that's the thing. But yeah. I mean, just, just Madhan Isa, right? Yeah. Even just that part, yeah. they, they are mm-hmm. you just change similar. one note and it's a completely yeah. different mood, even mm-hmm. if you just consider the Aave sequence. Mm-hmm. I'll, I'll add one more note to your. your your hash function there. <laughs> you don't even have to change notes. So even if you go between Basant and Paraj, Paraj. or Basant and Purvi, mm. right? They all have the same, same notes. Yes. But just the the weight that you yeah, yeah. put on a certain note or a certain phrase mm. completely changes, alters the rag, and the output is vastly different mm. from what you started off with. Let's say if you started off with Basant. Yeah. So so that filter. That's part, that part in the middle has been trained for so many years because mm-hmm. we listen to all these exactly. things. Exactly. Right. And that's what ca- causes us to recognize that beauty and recognize that difference. Can you, uh, this is open to all of you, um, you said we, we've listened to it for a long time, right? Can you recall the first time you heard Basan and what did you feel then versus after all these years of training your ears and your voice and your instrument to it? What? I'll Any go. difference? I'll go first. Go the first Basant I heard was Bhimsen Joshi's uh-huh. Ket Ki Gula from, <laughs> from Basant Bahar. From Basant Bahar. Uh-huh. Right? That Basant that he has executed there, I can just imagine Shankar Jakishan telling Bhimsen Joshi uh-huh. in the studio, just sing whatever you want, we'll okay. just roll the tape. Uh-huh. <laughs> and that's how, it, that's how that okay. magic happened. Right? And so that was the first, for me, the first introduction to mm-hmm. Basant. Okay. And we'll, we'll, I think I'm giving, I'm, I'm getting, getting ahead of myself, but we'll hear a Basant by, by his Guru's Guru, and you'll see shades of Abdul Karim Khan's Taan <laughs> in Deep Sen Joshi's Ket Ki Gula oh, okay. and that's no accident. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, yeah, that was my introduction to Basant. My um, um, first time I heard Basant was um, when I was a little girl. My mom is a very good singer, and she used to sing this bandish. Piya sang ke lori, and uh, so um, what beautiful song is this? I didn't know rags and all that that time. And but but my ears were always like, what is she singing? Mm-hmm. And then when I got a little older, then uh, she taught me that. Uh, but I still remember that uh, uh, tune. You know, you mm-hmm. listen mm-hmm. as your kids. You remember the tune, and and that really uh, I I loved that rag. You know, first time I heard it. Yeah. My first mem- most memorable basant was uh, by Pandit Jasraj. Ah. Our rag is sab bane barati, dula rag is really beautiful basant. Yes. And uh, my most memorable basant bahar was by Pandit Kulas Kashagar. Mm-hmm. 
Partly because I was playing Kanpur at the time, so it's a completely immersive different right. experience. Right. <laughs> but and, and even Basan Bahar here, uh, uh, in our organization, Basan Bahar he sang Basan Bahar. Uh, yes, sang I was there too. That was, was amazing. amazing yeah. Basan Bahar. So it's one of my most favorite that I heard. Thank you. So we move on to the next one. All right. So Nachiketa briefly mentioned uh, the next recording, and that's what we're about to hear. The next one is by Ustad Abdul Karim Khan. He was uh, considered to be the founder of the modern Kirana Gharana, was a noteworthy vocalist of Kirana Gharana style in the Hindustani vocal classical music. He was pivotal in popularizing this Gharana in Karnataka. Uh, he was born in Kirana, a village in Uttar Pradesh, in 1872. He's known to create a sublime atmosphere through his soothing voice, and he had a great musical career from the very beginning. He actually came from a family of Hindu musicians who later embraced Islam. Uh, he initiated his talim and from the age of five under the guidance of his father, Kale Khan, an outstanding khayal singer, and his uncle, Abdul Khan, and he gave his first public concert at the tender age of 11. He then became a court singer in the Royal Court of Baroda. Baroda was ruled by the Gaita of then. Besides his unmatchable vocal skills, Ustadji was also an accomplished sarangi, veena, sitar, and tabla player. Not only was he an expert on musical instruments, especially the veena and the sarangi, he was also an expert in repairing musical instruments. He always carried with him his set of tools for repairing instruments everywhere. After his stint at Baroda, he continued his journey to Mumbai, Pune, Miraj, and Karnataka. He was often invited to perform at the Royal Court of Mysore, where he learned the nuances of Carnatic music from the maestros at the court. He was awarded the Sangeet Ratna by the Maharaja of Mysore. He also established Arya Sangeet Vidyalaya and taught underprivileged students. And then he started another branch of this in Mumbai. The most important trait of Ustaji's gayaki was the precedence of bhava or expression over the lyrics or the words. He sang the words so softly that the musical expression of any composition he performed was prominent while the words got dissolved into the notes. His means, lengthy alaps, gamakas, sapatans were all his specialty in singing. He, he also sang tumris, Marathi songs and bhajans. He incorporated many elements of Carnatic music into Hindustani music. Khan Sahib was uh, contributed to the promotion uh, to promote a mutual understanding and a connect between Hindustani and Carnatic <coughs> music, which was phenomenal. He was one among very few Hindustani artists who gained and gained an in-depth understanding of Carnatic music in those times. He even recorded a Tyagraj Akriti, apparently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was sargams uh, extensively in his singing, and he popularized raga abhogi from Carnatic music and brought it to North India. Mm -hmm. His popularity reached South India as well, and he's performed in various places across India. And now we will move on to the piece. If one of you would like to introduce the piece, please go ahead. Um, so um, this is a, um, a really four-minute recording, I think, and it's a complete uh, basant in the, that uh, recording. And I would like to mention that pay attention to the... Uh, he uses Shuddha Dhaivat sometimes. Yes. And uh, when I learned Basant uh, from my guru, uh, she had she had mentioned that although we, we don't use that, but she had mentioned that it goes Maga Maga Ni Sa Ni Da Pa Maga Maga Ga Ma Da Ga. So that prayog is there, and he uses it so brilliantly. Mm -hmm. It comes mm -hmm. so just um, pay attention to that, and and of course oh. the, the melody that's his. Yeah. The best, uh, so melodious and sweet, so that that you cannot miss when he starts. <laughs> and his thoughts, yes, <laughs> this yes. sheer energy. Uh, and uh, I think the boltans, right? yes, mm -hmm. yes, a lot yes. of boltans. So, so just listen to to that. Those times, I think. Yeah, it was because of the seventy eight RPMs. The, oh. the content on this record itself yes. would not be no. too much. Right, so they had to show in three, four oh, minutes yeah. ah. everything about the rag. Yeah. The alab, the structure, the tans, the bandish, the 
Ha, you you heard the harmonium and tabla also. They had to show a little bit of that also. Yeah. Everything crammed in four minutes, and there was no post recording editing at that time. Everything was one take. Maybe even one microphone even. Yeah. Maybe just one mic. Yeah, I think that yeah. was so. It was just outstanding. Yeah. But you know, if you give somebody four hours to do the same thing, no guarantee they can do it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Because you know. The same thing, uh, for example, some of the old recordings of DG Police Club, Badi Bolaoni Khansa, Yadu Piya Piya, for example, yes, yes. less than four minutes, almost every singer has sung that for the last 70 years. <laughs> but nobody can reproduce those four minutes. <laughs> That's true. So they just have to reproduce it. Yes. Right? Even that cannot be done. Yeah. Uh, audience, members of the audience, please feel free to ask your questions. Uh, it doesn't have to be just this two way, it can be multi way as well. Um, is does Rag Basant, um, is it sung in Vilambit style? There is yeah. a Vilambit style. Yes, 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 very much so. Any questions? Otherwise, I have plenty. <coughs> I just don't want to monopolize. Yes, please go. Uh, maybe you talk about this later on, but uh, can you talk a little bit about how Basant captures spring and how Bahar captures spring and why are they so different, even though they're talking about the same season? Yeah, um, we have... Uh, you probably Bahar. Bahar. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. So let's listen to Sounds that. Good. And, <laughs> Sounds good. They actually go hand in hand. I, I feel like so naturally they are uh, after Basant this Bahar man this. Yeah. maybe because we, like you said uh, the, the, fi the film song that we listened uh, yeah. as children uh, those old uh, mm -hmm. ones and uh, when you li listen to Bahar I, I always see like the dance of a peacock mm -hmm. like it's immediately that uh, I get that image in, in my mind uh, and um, but sometimes I feel it's the, the for me it's a, after all it's personal but um, it's the start of spring, I feel, and Bahar is when it's there. Oh, it's it's full blossom. Awesome. 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 Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and both yeah. parent thoughts are different. So the exactly yeah. the, they so are completely different. Completely yeah. different yeah. <laughs> coffee and puri. So it's, it's, yeah. it's a, whoever thought of it the first time, I don't know how they came up with it. Yeah. Yeah. Is there a particular season where you feel? At your creative best. Oh. Uh, summer. <laughs> <laughs> well, why is that? Why is that for you? Because I just love the sun. Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, Being no. Yes. All the sun. All the sun. Yeah. Sun. Yeah. Uh, um, but uh, it's also the. Uh, for me, uh, the time of the day uh, is also very, very important. Mm -hmm. Early morning, mm -hmm. uh, I feel I feel most creative early morning. Okay. Um, and uh, then also during sunset time, um, Puriya, Marvel are my favorite rags. Um, so time of the day, um, these rags uh, and seasons, uh, the rags that are sung during seasons are only uh, very few, mm -hmm. um, but uh, for all the other rags they are uh, sung at a particular time of the day and you can really experience them when you practice those at that particular time you can really feel the raga that's yeah. my, my I, experience I, I, I side with her um, for me time of day is yeah. m I, I'm more inclined to the time of day rather than time of year okay. rather than time of season yeah. um, so any any rag at the time of day, it doesn't whether it's a night rag, morning rag, early in the morning, I'm I'm at my freshest mm -hmm. to think about it, to yeah. ruminate in it. And the second best time for me is when I'm driving. <laughs> That's many, many, an, many an exit have passed me by. <laughs> Yeah, it could be dangerous too. And unfortunately, like the song, it doesn't come back. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't. <laughs> How come you can't sing anything after Puriya Dhanashree? How come you cannot sing? Yeah. How come everything is just locked? <laughs> <laughs> you know, interesting you mentioned that. May 6th, 1995, 
Bhimsen Joshi came to UC Berkeley. Yes. He performed Pura Dhanashri. Yes. Right after Pura Dhanashri, he performed Pasan. Yes. So, right after Pura Dhanashri. And I could never, I couldn't believe my ears. And I, they were like radically different mm -hmm. rags. Awesome. Although the notes were so similar. Yes. And only he could pull it off. Mm -hmm. So, there is a... <laughs> there is one there, outlier. There, there is one outlier. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I think I think there is a reason for this. These, these are called Sanghi Prakash Rao. When, when you are transitioning from early morning, uh, twilight zone or early morning. So it's it's described as the best sadhana kal in the yogic yogi tradition as well. Called Brahma 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 Right. So any, any Sanghi Prakash kal is uh, thought to be the best or the most creative time of the day. Mm -hmm. Either morning or evening. Uh, and if you see the rags also, they reflect that. Mm -hmm. on one to one end of the spectrum, right. Marwan on the other side of the right. spectrum. <coughs> so these are very different character. Uh, the the Rags with a very different character. So you know, in general, Sandhi Prakash time is the best for creativity. Mm -hmm. In Lalit, uh, even though it's so early morning rag, it's it's uh, in Marwa Thai. Right, yeah, yeah, yes, so, yeah. It's yeah. So there is some Sandhi Prakash yeah. symmetry there. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you for that. Alright, so we move on to the next one. Okay, so the next artist uh, we're going to listen to is Gambu Bai Hangal. She was born into a musical family. Both her mother and her grandmother were established musicians in Carnatic South Indian tradition. Although her mother also maintained a strong interest in Hindustani music. Uh, Gangu Bai learned the basics of Indian music, most notably the technique of singing using the traditional sargam from her mother. And she began performing publicly before she reached her teenagers. When she was 13, she began to train in the Hindustani tradition at a music academy in the city of Hubli, now Hubli Dharwad, with Krishnacharya Halgur, a kinnari uh, player. Uh, apparently, the kinnari is a stringed instrument like the veena. Gangubai <coughs> learned 60 compositions in one year before he stopped teaching her after an argument about his fees. So, reminder to all of you, pay your gurus on time or <laughs> you may not learn the antra to your bandha. <laughs> At age 15, she became a disciple of the virtuoso Hindustani vocalist Savai Gandharva. After which there was no turning back. He was an exponent of the Kirana Dharana. Gangubai Hangal's mother's family was considered to be of low social status. And for women of her generation, singing was not considered appropriate employment. Gangubai, however, struggled against this pre prejudice and she persisted and made a career for herself as a musician. She performed all over India and, for, and all India radio stations and attained popularity as an eminent musician. Gangubai's vocal quality, sensitivity to pitch and melody and technical proficiency were among the most remarkable features of her style. She sang with a distinctively bold, almost masculine tone. She typically introduced the melodic framework, the raga of each piece gradually so that the audience could savor and recognize the importance of each note, impeccably intoned, and ornamented passages of improvisation using sargam came later and featured prominently in her performances. Now over to our panelists to introduce the next piece, the raga and uh, what you want the listeners to listen to. So Gangoba has sung rag Bahar here, right? Yeah. And you you will see first of all both Basant and Bahar are Uttarang rags, mm -hmm. as in they levitate towards the upper registers. Whereas most mortals would go up and come down, uh -huh. right? Or be in the in the mid range, not Gangoba. Mm -hmm. She stays up there. And you, there is, there isn't a, a false note, a missed note, a, a, a mediocre note that she, that she presents here. It is, it is, it's, it's in a class by itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, um, you introduced Shiva Sangha. Oh, yes, about yeah. Nanguba herself, right. I also so, have one. Yeah. <laughs> so, her Nanguba's son, Manoj, and my father grew up together. They were classmates in primary school in Hubli. 
and uh, in Gadag Hubli, in the Gadag Hubli area. So they, they would play together and so my father knew her very well, wow. but not as a musician, oh. <laughs> as a friend's mother, okay. right? So uh, several years later, when I started learning from my guru, Pandit Basavaraj Rajguru, we happened, we happened, my, my, my guru happened to introduce me to her at one meeting and then well, by the way, she would call my guru Baswani mm -hmm. because he was much younger to her and he would call her. He, so he introduced me to her and all that. And then she said, so where are you from? Who are you and what? Then I said to my father, oh, you are Suresh's son? <laughs> Why didn't you tell me that before? <laughs> so I had a very, very nice personal connection with her as well. And that to me is an absolute honor. Wow. <laughs> Quite a story. <laughs> yeah, so uh, in, um, I think it was 2007, I had um, um, performed in Dharwad. And um, the organizers, um, they uh, I asked them that Gangubai, I knew she, uh, she uh, lived in Hubli, which is very close from Dharwad. So they uh, they asked me, would you like to go and uh, meet her? I said, of course, <laughs> of course. <laughs> so, uh, 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 I went uh, there and uh, she was, uh, I think, uh, 91 or probably you. Yeah. And uh, she was so, uh, like a young person, uh, although she had uh, hips, gone through a hip surgery and she she, could, she told me that I'm able to sit now yes. and she was smiling. <laughs> uh, I, was, I was bedridden but I'm, I'm now able to sit. And she sharp, was so happy to see me, attack. like, yeah, 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 and yeah. she, uh, uh, she said, uh, if, uh, uh, if I was better, I would have loved to come and hear you say, <laughs> oh my goodness, <laughs> no, and, and uh, she said, itna acha laga, Marathi mein baat ki hai, I'm feeling so good that you are doing, Sangeet ka prasar videsh mein, Tum kar rahe ho, mujhe bohat khushi hai, us baat ki to. Bohat, so simple, simple, Padma Vibhushan. No, and then she, she told me a story, which is, I really want to share. So, she said that she was young and she started performing and she had a concert somewhere in the north. So, they used to travel by train. And the uh, train, um, it was like a full 24 hours, I don't know. But um, there was another lady who was like a beautiful lady and uh, they, they were in the same um, sitting, like next to each other and they were talking. And, and then uh, when um, they uh, got down at the station, those, um, the organizers, whoever had organized her concert, um, they came with these um, garlands and heart leke aaye and and wo, uh, wo beautiful aurat koi laal hai. I thought she was gone. <laughs> and, uh, she told me this story because she said, no, no, I am ordinary looking person. But she, she thought that she was the uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll uh, never forget this, uh, that uh, moment that we spent together. <laughs> that, that kind of simplicity is somehow a sign of greatness. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, I, I, I share one story of Pustak uh, 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 how, you know, how these people, there is a lot to learn from these people outside of music also. So this is a real story that happened in Akola. I, somebody I know was present there and there was a tabla solo uh, happening and he was listening. So uh, he, there was a young guy playing, he met him in the intermission or uh, uh, so, you know, after his performance, then he gave him five rupees and he told him that, you know, that specific kaida that you played that I don't know, can you teach it to me? <laughs> oh. Oh. And this guy was like completely speechless, okay? So Ustad Tirakma is coming to him and he's, uh, for that moment, he said, okay, can you teach that to me? I'm think of you, thinking of you as my guru. Oh, wow. oh my God! You know that's what he meant. He gave him five rupees on those days and said, so "Can can you teach me that kind of that I don't have?" <laughs> so it's completely out of you know the humility and the greatness is something that we can't imagine. We we have to learn from them. <laughs> well said. 
So now we've switched over from Ram Basan to Ram Bahar. Mm -hmm. um, what are your thoughts on this rag and how it is different from uh, Basan? You did talk about, yeah. you know, it comes later. But musically, uh, what are the, you know, what are the things to watch out for? Musically, they're completely different. Mm -hmm. Like um, Prasad said, this is uh, more in the Kannada angle, like the, the Gama, Esa. And uh, also, uh, the uh, because of Kaki Thad, the um, I particularly noticed the Bageshri also in uh, the Gama Nidha, mm -hmm. this part. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> No, no, it's fine. Mm -hmm. the, the, so because like Nashiket said that he um, she uh, always stays up stays in the higher uh, so. The, mm. that, that part I noticed that uh, yes. Bhagishri is a little bit there. Mm. 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 Yeah, in, in my opinion, this is the best Bahar composition that I've heard. Mm. I've heard it from Pandit Dil Singh Jashi out of this world. Yeah, I, I, I was telling Nachikeda before that when we listen, uh, we've been listening to the whole playlist. Uh, um, I listened to it several times. Um, and uh, Kalyana Sangha Karata that's the only uh, but, but should, that yeah, is what stuck yeah. in my mind <laughs> you, you don't, you don't yes. even have to mention the rag when you say Kalyana Sangha <laughs> yeah. it's yeah. Bahar of course yeah. it's Bahar yeah. so, some compositions become synonymous with the yeah. Bahar yeah. Yeah. Vatapi is always Hamsatha yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 and then um, you know, this definitely has that Bahar feel um, uh, and because of the Uttarang emphasis, um, but it's it's so. Uh, and we talked about only the uh, swara part of it. But if you look at, you know, in general, uh, you look at if you look at the composition, and where the terab is, mm. and where the space is created for elaboration. This this is one of the ideal compositions, I think. So you know, my most favorite uh, place to start a gat is a composition is on the seven beat. Or the, or the 12th beat. Because you, you can show that um, there is certain optimality associated with it, but those are the best places to yeah. uh, start Kinta compositions mm -hmm. in this life. Yes. Mm. Also, my most favorite uh, place to start a Tan is actually the 4th beat. Mm. Okay. Because it's easier to catch up with the other. That's my personal. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you see a lot of these uh, places where she starts the town, how, how, the, how she, uh, the, all the Thera, all the Laikari, mm. it's, um, it's, it's, you know, the, all of it is a package together that keeps you hooked. Yeah. You mentioned, oh, go ahead. Yes, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to also say the, the ease with which she does these dance, mm. right? I mean, of course, this is Gangubai, but... <laughs> the the tans that she's doing it doesn't take away from the beauty of bahar it is these are not generic tans that mm -hmm. she's doing but e even then she's doing things like mm. right she does that and then she then she comes back a little little further down the scale and then goes back up and then she puts all all this in a beautiful package mm -hmm. and th there's one tan and the next tan is something slightly different mm -hmm. but it's different right she she presents the rag beautifully <coughs> you connecting the wadi samadhis and so on it's such a beautiful structure the whole composition does full justice to the wadi samadhis the space where and of course the way she sang yeah. You mentioned you had a personal connection to her. Have you ever had an informal session where she's sung or you have sung for her? Or, you know, I, have sung, I have sung for her with, okay. because she asked me to sing. <laughs> <laughs> How did that go? <laughs> I, I, I was a bottle of wax. <laughs> it was just, it, it was, I was so nervous singing. But, but then she, 
she tried to make me feel so comfortable oh, right so because she is like why are you so nervous uh-huh. i know i know your guru i know your father just just say it <laughs> yeah that's supposed to make it easy <laughs> Yeah, but she was a very, very sweet woman. Mm-hmm. Extremely. Uh, isn't uh, like your your uh, style of singing uh, is quite uh, similar? Yes, yes. I, I, I yeah. I, I I was thinking. I think your sounds are yeah, yeah similar, I, right? Yeah. Yeah. I I think it comes from the fact that there's a like the Kirana element uh, to my guru's right. teaching also, and they learned my guru also learned from Savai Gandharva a little bit. Right. and so there is yeah. definitely that element mm-hmm. and and he my guru re- regarded gangubai mm-hmm. as not just an older sister kind of thing but not an equal some somebody higher mm-hmm. um, so he had that that kind of respect for gangubai and so whatever she did he tried to in, in, in fact my guru has sang kaliyan sang karta oh. and he used to listen to gangubai's <laughs> just to get ideas <laughs> wow that's <laughs> wonderful where is pandit radguru genius come from in his outlining of the bandish because he's <coughs> a composer who plays with the notes as mm. well as the laikari as well as with the tankari in a bandish mm. which is so amazing how come that's not been expressed anywhere else <laughs> i think it has to do with his pedigree yeah. and then the fact that he learned from 11 gurus so oh. he he got the best out of everybody and then he was he was an avid listener Uh, and also a very brash artist brash mm-hmm. in the sense he would challenge others mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and so he, with that kind of attitude with that demeanor he would m- make sure that he would be prepared his bondish is not typical they are not they are yeah, not. and no. i think yeah i don't think anyone has played around with the words in yeah. such a beautiful way and he also had that the very special thing that he used to do where he would take a bondish in a rag and then sing it in a completely different rag <laughs> so you you take a a a laya bilal bandish has sanget and shuddha sang and things like that you would do that just for the sake of it and you would never know <laughs> i just had a question about yeah. this bandish she almost reached the upper sa like a lower sa in this yes yeah. so doesn't she doesn't was, she then yeah so and she, yeah she she goes higher yeah and so comfortably mm. so i was just wondering if that's an uttarang pradhan rag vaishishtya or is it th- she she is doing that is that her thing or is it i think, it's, thing, I think, it's, her. It? I think okay. it's her <laughs> and also the bandish ends on high sa yeah. so uh, the first line mm. right mm. like like i'm saying also, yeah. yeah most ordinary people would hit that sa and come yeah. down <laughs> somewhere <laughs> that grab and then end yeah. on the first line it ends on low sa here it goes back every time it ends Yeah. 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 Vilayat Khan was born in Gorakhpur, Maimen Singh in then East Bengal, which is currently Bangladesh. His father, Inayat Khan, was recognized as a leading sitar and surbahar player of his time, as had been his <coughs> grandfather Imdad Khan before him. He was taught in the family style known as the Imdad Khani Gharana by his father and other relatives in the family. Imdad Khani Gharana is also known as Itawa Gharana. and it's known uh, after a small city close to agra where indad khan used to live this family represents the sixth generation of musicians that date back to the mughal empire however inayat khan died when vilayat was only 10 so much of his education came from the rest of his family his uncle sitar and surbahar maestro wahid khan and his maternal grandfather singer bande hasan khan and his mother bashir and begum who had studied the practice procedure of his forefathers as a boy vilayat wanted to be a singer but his mother herself from a family of vocalists felt he had a strong responsibility to bear the family torch as a sitar maestro in fact in this recording uh, there are a series of recordings but we're going to play one piece later the ustad has actually sung a thumri in this particular recording 
Yeah, but we are going to only. I know. But I, I, <laughs> <laughs> He's also composed music for several films. Uh, including Jal Sagar, The Guru, and Kadambari. He, in fact, introduced newcomer Kavita Krishnamurti in Kadambari, which was the first song of Akhili. An interesting tidbit about his lineage, the Imdad Khan family is of Rajput lineage. In an informal uh, continuation of his Rajput lineage, Vilayat Khan's father, Inayat Khan, kept a Hindu name of Nath Singh. Vilayat Khan himself has composed many bandishes using the pen name Nath Pia. And he did confirm in an interview with the BBC saying uh, he does have a Rajput name called Kahan Singh. Um, one interesting um, piece about uh, this legend, until recently, uh, legend's car with the registration plate named Sitar sat in a garage at his Princeton home. It has now been sold off, but that's something interesting that we did not know about the Usa. There's three main styles of Sitar. One is Mayhar Sanya, uh, Pandit Ravi Shankar, Mikhil Banerjee, have they belong to that style. And um, that style imbibes a lot of uh, uh, lineage from Veena as well as Dhrupad. Pandit Mikhil Banerjee brought, brought Dhrupad into the Sita. Uh, the, the, uh, the other style that I learned is Jafar Khani Bas, Ustad Abdul Hamid Jafar Khan sir. Uh, his lineage is from Ustad Bandai Ali Khan Sahib, again Vinkari style. Mm -hmm. There are some unique techniques that they have developed for Vinkari that are uh, that are made to the sitar. So that there is 10 basic alankars of sitar, but you'll find different emphasis in uh, different guys. <coughs> so, the, you know, for example, Khatkami, Murki, Gamak, mm -hmm. Gada, Gasit, all of those. There is 10, 10 of those. Uh, now, uh, like Vilayat, Ustad Vilayat Khan Sahib used to believe that uh, his version of sitar was mostly to uh, follow vocal music. Mm. So he got rid of one octave. So there's three octaves in the sitar that he played. Also the tone is like vocal music. Mm. The alankar used are like vocal music. Uh, so we will hear that in this recording. And there is some rag which are very specific to that garana. Just like the other garanas as well. Uh, so uh, I heard one story um, that Ustad Vilayat Khan Sahib's grandfather played only three rags in public concerts in his entire life. Oh, wow. Yaman, Khamaj and Puriya. Yeah. <laughs> so you will see that you know, in his gharana, they are like double PhDs whenever they play this rag. <laughs> you know, they, there is so much depth in that. <laughs> so, they played only, uh, so breadth versus depth. <laughs> And then we play the tabla with our right hand. Oh. <laughs> That's the timekeeper hand, okay. right hand. And left hand is the main hand. Mm -hmm. So you see a lot of laikari here, anagat, abhid. Uh, the new, so you know, the, the vocal <coughs> sequence. What was that? What, how was that sound coming? Oh, you know, it, it's an outward stroke oh. where you play two strings at a time. Oh. So we have to show it with oh. Piyamala. Okay. Yeah. So the, there's a technique for that. And then, uh, <coughs> so the sequence of sitar development is usually the first thing is Gat Vistar where he kept adding a little variations in the Gat itself, the composition mm -hmm. itself. Mm -hmm. Not too much deviation, just the last few notes. So a lot of variation in that. So next next comes Rag Vistar. Then he had this quiet moment where he would come up and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, then comes Lai Vistar. Then you do uh, different uh, you, you, you know, there's a lot of Peshkaran that we play in sitar, not very obvious here, but you can uh, it's more obvious in Vilambic compositions. There's Gatvistar, there's Ragvistar, there's Laivistar, and then there's short tans, there is larger, you know, bigger tans, and so on. And so, the, you know, it also inherits a lot of things from Tabla. Ah, I see. Because we play the Tabla with the right hand, we we'll sing with the left hand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you're a right hand. No, no, the hemisphere of the brain don't change. <laughs> <laughs> Some people have attempted to create a left-handed sitar, uh, but uh, you know, sitar, every sound needs left and right hand synchronization. Mm. So, if you are naturally dominant in your right brain, which is the creativity brain, then you'll have good mean. You'll have, you'll have the better singing part. Mm -hmm. If your left brain is dominant, which is more concrete thinking, concrete things, and then you'll do more strokes and more like that. Mm -hmm. So you know, you notice that there's and and then you know, being gifted with both the sides of the brain is like God's gift. <laughs> <laughs> but but you know, 
you can either emphasize the lighter aspect or you can emphasize the singing aspect. Can you expand a bit more between the differences of the Mahad and this uh, vocal tradition? Yeah, because I'm going to do that in the uh, Miyamala part. Because in the Sarot, for example, you have, of course, Mahad, and you know, with its mean and everything derived from the Rupas, and then you have Senya Shajanpur, right. which is basically Pandit Radhika Mohan Mojro. Yeah. You know? And yeah. that stroke play yeah. is unique. Very unique. Yeah. So, do you have something like that with the shetar? Uh, when, when we get to the further yeah, section, yeah, yeah. there is some absolutely amazing compositions by Pandit Radhika Mohan Maitra. Huh. There is one in Rag Bass, which huh. is my most favorite of any bass. Huh. Uh, I'll see if I can show that today, but uh, maybe, maybe maybe I can certainly show the Miyamala part. Huh. Uh, the difference in the Lathani style, the Jafarthani style, other styles. Yeah, yeah. Because Buddha Dakutra took up that uh, yes. Radhika Mohan Mahatma's flag, and he basically his stroke play creates these tankari, yeah. uh, which are called akhara tans, and they play four five notes in one stroke. It's unbelievable. Yeah, so when I learned, yeah. was from Pandit Parthachatri, who got it from uh, uh, Radhika Mohan Mahatma. Yes. Uh, sorry, uh, from Buddha Dada. Uh, but uh, original composer. Is Pandit Radhika Mohan Mahatma. Yeah. You will find it on YouTube. Some truly outstanding compositions. Awesome. Thank you. Just one quick note on the <coughs> composition you just heard. The playfulness mm -hmm. of the Rag yeah. Bahar. Yeah. He brought it out so beautifully. Right? And this is a perfect example of how Bahar inherently is so nice and playful right. and he's enhancing it. He's having so much yeah. fun. Yeah. So much fun yeah. he's having. Yeah. <laughs> He almost seems enamored by that one part where he kind of stays yes, uh, in yes, that area yes. for a long time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, we'll move on to the next piece uh, in our session today. The next one is uh, sung by Pandit D.V. Paluskar. Uh, D.V. Paluskar is a well-known Hindustani musician uh, born to Vishnu Digambar Paluskar, D.D. Paluskar. He was only 10 years old when his father died, and so he was subsequently trained by Pandit Vinayak Rao Patwardhan and Pandit Narayan Rao Vyas. He was also trained by Pandit Chin Chin Chintaman Ra Rao Paluskar and Pandit Mirashi Bhuva. Uh, D.V. Paluskar, uh, the D stands for Dattatreya, Dattatreya Vishnu Paluskar was a child prodigy who came into the national limelight when he came his, uh, gave his debut performance at the famed Hari Vallab Sangeet Sammelan in Punjab at the age of 14. At our last session, uh, Nachiketa as well as the other artists mentioned, you know, that everything would literally stop. His mom would ask to stop everything at the household when Devi Paluskar came on the radio. He was such a, uh, something precious to listen to that everything else had to be put on hold. Um, my husband and I were discussing this topic on our walk the other day, <clears throat> that this Gen Z generation doesn't have a lack of anything, doesn't have to wait for anything. Everything is on stream, on demand, you know. So they will never know the joy of waiting for something yes. and, oh my God, when is that song going to play on the radio? Yes. But then it does come on, oh, there's my reward. <laughs> you know, that, that's, the, that's the feeling that, that you had mentioned last time. Yes. Um, <clears throat> an interesting tidbit about D.B. Paluskar, who was also um, affectionately known as Bapu Rao, uh, there's a scene uh, in Jugal Mandi form between Thansen and Baiju in the film Baiju Baura. And Nausha Dali wrote the music and he wanted uh, classical singers for this. And he reached out to his friends to get classical singers. Um, D.V. Paluska was a very quiet, humble man who had, he, he literally had to be cajoled by his friends to go and uh, accept this assignment. He was afraid that singing in films would spoil his style. So they told him he would have absolute freedom to expound and present the composition in any style that he preferred without interference. Thus assured, he sang in the Jugal Bandi form with none other than Ustad Ali Khan. Mm -hmm. The two great artists matched in every aspect in this uh, movie and therefore this Jugal Bandi performance came to be known as uh, the most interesting and the best highlight of the film. Sadly, Pandit Devi Puluskar passed away at a very early age of 34, so we only got a couple of decades with him. I wish he had stayed with us longer. Yeah, and the story goes that when Mr. Amir Khan Sahib, he had to lose on the screen, right, to, in, to Baiju, uh, to Baiju Baba, ah. uh, to, uh, and he was Tansen. 
Okay. And then he said, if I were to lose, uh -huh. I would lose at the hands of Pandit Devi Paluska. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So he, he, he actually suggested his name, is what the story yes. is. Yes, okay. Yeah. I uh, Bandish, when it starts, you will know that it's um, the, uh, there's a famous film song that is based on this, this Bandish. And uh, the Divi Paluskar style, it's the, like Prasad, I remember his words from last time, it's like the rag stretch. It's like a textbook. He's, uh, when he sings any rag, you, you know how the rag is. You know, uh, the, the whole structure is so clear. And um, his, um, I, I really like his tan patterns a lot. Uh, any any rag. Uh, uh, that Akash only recorded. Right. Uh, oh. And I think it's on uh, Raju Asokan's channel. So if you do YouTube search, it's absolutely stunning. Miyamandar as well as there's one uh, Gaur Mandir. <coughs> he looks quite young. Yes, <laughs> yes. 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 No music begins at forty. It's <laughs> all <laughs> said in right. you know, classical music, but not for him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you just sound like a senior. Yeah, right, yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah, incredible. That's why we wanted to expand on rag Yeah, we are waiting to. Do. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, if if. Uh, if Lalak is the story of dialogue between the two Mallars, Mia Mallar is the story of dialogue between two Nishads, in my opinion. It's very rare to find one Nishad after the other. Mm -hmm. And then uh, one of the most memorable live Mia Mallar's concert I heard was by, um, uh, this was days other than Ustad Abdul Amir Dafar Khan sir, by Vinishi Veda Sarasadhi. Mm -hmm. yeah. And she, she you know, usually, some rags have blessed certain artists because they have done like years of uh, right. dependence so, yeah, to the rag. Yeah, so the, the rags is okay. Uh, uh, wishes granted. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, Meena Sasabade had really mastered uh, Mia Malar, you know. Uh, other than, of course, Pandit Devi Paluska and, of course, Pandit Bhimsen Ji, he's like out of this world. Oh, Mia yes, <laughs> But uh, we, we are talking about the difference between different styles, so I thought maybe I can show that with Mandar. <coughs> because if you listen to uh, Ustad Vilayat Khan Sahib's Mandar, it, it's like the beginning of the monsoon. Uh, after a long summer, it's mm. very pleasant. And then mm. the, the, it's not pouring torrentially yet, <coughs> but uh, yeah. So his, his composition also reflects that. Nishad, after Nishad, otherwise extremely rare, rare, right? I mean, if you have two Nishads, you'll have one in our one in our mm -hmm. So with that phrase, the Ram began, it flowered, and it's done. You know, just... Mm -hmm. right. Now, Ustad Virat Khan Sahib's composition, meaning uh, it's Itawa composition, I don't know who actually created that. I mean, now that was missing in, or that was different in Pandit Divi Paluska's recording. <laughs> His focus was more on Ray. Mm -hmm. uh, more conventional structure of Niyamallar is this. story about how I, I learned Mia Mulla from Ustad Abdul Rahim Gafar Khan. So one day, uh, when I went to his place for my lesson, I had forgotten to take my umbrella. And this was Mumbai rains pouring torrentially. And I got out of the bus, it's literally, you know, a few hundred feet distance, but I was completely drenched. And then I thought maybe I'm going to skip today's lesson. Um, so I was about to turn back. Then I saw Guruji coming <laughs> with his umbrella. He used to go for a daily walk 
so his, his house was uh, near ocean mm -hmm. it was on ocean front he saw he called me mm -hmm. so i said you know uh, i'm so wet right now that i'm going to go back mm -hmm. i'll come back some other time he said no this is the time for me amanda <laughs> <laughs> so he took me in his umbrella mm -hmm. took me to his home i was completely wet mm -hmm. he gave me a towel i sat there next two hours you know it, it takes great fortune to have yes, those two hours yes, in your life. Yes, yes. So he taught me his composition, yeah. and maybe if I had taken that umbrella that day, I wouldn't have learned this composition. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, it, so the next composition is in Jaffa Fan style, completely different flavor of Miyamanda as compared to the previous one. So first you got drenched by rain, then you got drenched by Miyamanda. <laughs> 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 so for this I probably need to set the tabla on because it's woven so well with the beat and it goes in high speed so I'll probably wrap it up in two minutes. <coughs> A totally different flavor. How's it going? Starts at a slightly different place and connection. So what's going on in the nature is going out going on, on his sitar. Mm -hmm. He was pouring outside, his thoughts are also responding to that. In my opinion, it has to do with a, a lot to do with convention and tradition and sort of uh, pre-existing mm -hmm. notions that are there, and especially in the vocal part, <clears throat> in the vocal segment, the the lyrics 
they they they, they, they fortify that that convention. Yeah. So you hear garaj garaj barse or umand ghumand ghanai, right? Then you you you're probably thinking, oh okay, this is rain season. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, that that's just my opinion. But I I I will say that the the malhar that that what I call the mo- the malhar molecule, mm-hmm. right? It really brings out a sense of maybe a, an anticipation mm-hmm. of rain that mare pa ma pa ga mare pa that mare pa i think it, it is so rightly the 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 the, the tie that binds all the different malhars ma pa da ni sa ma pa ni da ni sa doesn't matter how how you go up mm-hmm. but that mare pa i think that yeah. that 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 beautiful mm-hmm. that structure i think it gives a um, the feeling of hey there is something about to happen yeah. and then there is maybe human to human going on uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for that all right we'll move on to the next piece the next is also a sitar uh, piece by pandit nikhil bhanar ji uh he was an indian classical sitarist of the mehar ghana that uh, prasad earlier referenced uh, along with pandit avi shankar and usad bilay khan he emerged as one of the leading exponents of the sitar in uh, 1947 nikhil bhanerji met alauddin khan who was to become his main guru along with his son ali akbar khan both were sarod players they were in sitar players so nikhil bhanerji persistently went to all of alauddin khan's concerts and was desperate to have him as a teacher Alauddin Khan sir did not want to take on any more students but he changed his mind after listening to one of Banerjee's radio bro- broadcasts Alauddin Khan was Banerjee's main teacher and after he left my heart he also learned from Ali Akbar Khan the son of Alauddin Khan for many years Ustad Alauddin Khan was passing on not only the playing technique but also the musical knowledge and the approach of the Mehar Ghana Yet there was a definite trend in his teaching to infuse the sitar and uh, sitar and sarod with the beena baj aesthetic of the rudra veena uh, the sur bahar and the sur sringa into the uh, intricate neend work that he taught them he was also well known for adjusting his teaching to his particular students strengths and weaknesses consequently under his teaching ravi shankar and nikhil banerji developed very different sitar styles Nikhil Manji is uh, revered for his mastery in both melodic and rhythmic aspects of Indian music. His unique style is considered to have completeness, emotion and depth. According to Nikhil Banerji, music making was a spiritual rather than a worldly path. He said this is not religion but it is spiritualism. It is way beyond that. And this is how Indian music was practiced uh, by Meera Bai Tyagaraja Haridas Swami and Baiju and that is what music is supposed to do. Actually, Aladdin Khan played every musical instrument known to man, <laughs> and he actually the surbahar from Annapurna Devi was actually the first time it was brought out as a concert instrument. No one had ever played the surbahar before, <laughs> and Annapurna Devi unfortunately became so reclusive that you know it's sad that she wasn't heard more often. Yeah, yeah, that's so sad. Yeah. But yeah, with Ustad Aladdin Khan sir used to play forty instruments, <laughs> and he was actually director of that orchestra. No, oh, wow. my head orchestra. Yeah, that orchestra. Yes, my head. Yes, yes. That spent a lot of time in Europe. He toured Europe, and then he came back. And then a uh, very very unique stories about him. And he was very strict with. Uh, <coughs> yeah, I know those stories. Yeah, Guruji Ravi Shankar has some stories about that. Yeah. <laughs> he used to lock them in a small room. and stay the whole day there and, you know you play your instrument all this so this is a rag meg that we are going to play which is first it was uh, yamalla uh, and uh, and now it's meg which is um, like nachiketa said re pa ma pa re ni sa re Yeah. there's no need and he said everything but that malhar uh, um, ang is there ni pare re pare ni pare sara so why did you can you explain the difference between the re pa and shri and the re pa here 
Oh, uh, I mean, it's still common. That is common Yeah, now the closest one here is uh, Madhmaat Sarang. <coughs> yeah, but, mm. but the Madhmaat Sarang is identical now. Yeah, yeah. Madhmaat Sarang is actually Madhyamanta Sarang. Mm. So it means every phrase ends in Ma. Mm. So <laughs> you'll find Repa Ma as the end phrase in almost every Madhmaat Sarang. Whereas here the focus is more on poems. <coughs> And then he, he, he also has a slight use of Shuddha Deva just to keep the Mandharang. But that Meg is out of this world. Yeah. There's also similarity between um, uh, Meg and Nanki Kanada. Right, right. And uh, Mapani Sare, if you just yeah. focus. Kanada, it's, uh, yeah. yeah. But then so in my house, they, they <laughs> say that there are three original Mandars. Mia mm -hmm. came much later. So three original Mandars were Meg, Bes. It's thought to be the Mandar family and Gaur Mandar. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And uh, the and Gaur Mandar itself is made up of Shuddha Mandar, which is to be like Durga. So if you draw that diagram, you'll see that you know, there's a lot of uh, uh, inheritance from different tribes. Mm -hmm. One of my really favorite uh, Mandars is also uh, Ramdasi Malhar, mm -hmm. which has a Shuddha Gandhar uh, mm -hmm. in it. And uh, uh, Ustad Amir Khan has a beautiful uh, rendition. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> there is definitely a school of thought that says that the three rags that are similar in scale, Madhvat Sara, Meg, and Meg Malhar, are three distinct rags. So there is a the big difference between Meg and Meg Malhar is that Marepa. Mm -hmm. Mm, this would distinguish the Malhar part of the Meg. But the plain Meg. Re, re, pa, ma. Re, ma, pa, ni, pa, ma, pa, ma. Re, 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 pa, ma. Very subtle. Ma, re, pa versus ma, re, pa, ma. Right? Then there is Madhmat Sarang itself, which is a Sarang. Because it's a sarang, it has a very strong ray. Re ma pa ni ba ma re ni sa re. Re ma ni ba ma ba ma ni ba ma re ni sa re pa ma re. They sound so similar, but if you analyze it even more, and I think what Nikhil Banerjee plays here is definitely make. Mm -hmm. with, 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 yes. there, there is. There is very little, if not any, um, of that that Malhar ang of Meg Malhar is not there. So I'm pretty sure he had recorded this with a very clear intention of it making is, it Meg. Yeah, it Meg. Yeah. yeah. In terms of the technical parts that he's got into the guitar, the bold parent, thumb parent, other things, he's, he saw the strokes, right? and then the patterns that he got into the jord that he played here. His, his contribution, okay, and he. Yeah. <laughs> All of that, he got from Bolparan, and he got a lot of elements of Drupad into this part. Mm -hmm. Usually played in Jod parts so before the gut starts, but he's. He's able to play anything he wants anywhere. So he, <laughs> <laughs> that's a different thing. <laughs> that was a brilliant piece. Thank you for that. Um, I just want to point out that we're at 5.05 p.m. We said we would end the event at 5. Um, Uma actually uh, approached me to cut the last piece, but we cannot because it is by Ustad Amir Khan, So there is no way we can cut this. So we try to keep it as short as we can. <laughs> So Ustad Amir Khan was one of the greatest um, and most influential Indian vocalists in the Hindustani vocal tradition. He was the founder of the Indore Garana. Amir Khan was born into a family of musicians in Kalanaur, India. His father, Shahmir Khan, a Sargi and Veena player of the Bhindi Bazaar Garana, served at the court of the Holkars of Indore. His grandfather, Change Khan, was a singer in the court of Bahadur Shah Zafar. Amir Khan was initially trained in the Sarangi by his father. However, seeing his interest in vocal music, his father gradually devoted more time to vocal training, focusing on the Meru Khand technique. Mm. Um, I'm hoping one of you will be able to mm -hmm. um, you know, explain what the Meru Khand is for the audience here. 
Amir Khan was exposed at an early age to many different styles, since just about every musician who visited Indore would come to their house, and there would be mehfils at their place on a regular basis. He also learned the basics of tabla playing from one of his maternal uncles, who was a tabla player. Amir Khan was a virtually self-taught musician. He had a rich baritone, open-throated voice with a three-octave range. He developed his own gaiki, influenced by styles of Abdul Wahid Khan, Rajab Ali Khan, and Aman Ali Khan. This unique style is now known as the Indoor Gharana. The style he evolved was a unique fusion of intellect and emotion, of technique and temperament, and talent and imagination. Unlike other artists, he never made any concessions to popular taste, but always stuck to his pure, almost puritanical highbrow style. He felt that classical renderings needed to be made more beautiful while remaining faithful to the spirit and the grammar of the raga. Sound like somebody else we know? <laughs> he used to say, Nagma vahi nagma hai jo ru sune aur ru sunai. Which means only that is a melody that the soul can speak and listen to. His was an introverted, dignified darbar style. He also believed that poetry was important in khayal compositions. And he has left us several compositions with his pen name, Surrang, which means colored in Swara. Now let's go and uh, listen to this piece with a preamble if you want to add something. Yeah, I uh, wanted to um, include uh, this piece because it, it summarizes the whole, uh, I feel like it summarizes our whole um, topic of uh, the season and rags. And uh, I want, want you to um, pay attention to how you know, uh, this is Basan Bahar that we are going to listen, and uh, it's a Jod Ram. But uh, how he goes from one rag to another, <laughs> you can't it's even, you know, it happens so, so subtle, uh, uh, subtle moments. So that is uh, amazing, and uh, it's not just showing the structure, but the Basan Bahar is a whole rag. So uh, that's all right, because we are. Uh, um, over time, so um, I don't, don't want to talk much. So let's hear. There are very few rags that have all 12 notes. Mm -hmm. Pasan Bahar is one of them. Uh, we were talking about earlier, Pilu or Mishra Pilu can expand and get all the 12 notes. Ali Akbar Khan had created a rag called Lakshmi Ki Bhairavi. Oh, so okay. where he had all 12 notes in it. But to so effortlessly weave between Basant and Bahar, and just uh, he, he he turns a mixture into a solution. Scientist here too. I bet the harmonium player had the hardest. He had the hardest. Yes. <laughs> yes. But he followed he so beautifully. But he still couldn't keep up. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very hard rap. <laughs> Switching so fast. Yes. Yes. And, and there's only one junction here, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So if you miss that junction, you know, instead of the train going from one rail to the other, it will be there. Yeah. 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 Yeah in meaning, <laughs> they combined the two, oh, okay. Basant and Bahar, I don't know. Yeah. Perhaps probably in, uh, in um, films, it probably can. Yeah, very likely, yeah. very likely, because the, is the, there is the Gambhir versus the playful, yeah. and the combination. Yeah. Alright, any, uh, I think we have time for one last question from the audience, uh, perhaps somebody who hasn't asked a question yet, if you'd like to. So I have a, a, a curiosity question. So these, I mean, if you give the same four minutes to any of these artists, do you think they will reproduce the exact same thing? It's the same rag. But there will be a slight, you know, Definitely. Yes. Definitely. Yes, of course. Okay. Yes. The same caliber, I'm sure. The same but, caliber. But the same uh, content, I every time you hardly doubt it. Oh, 
Yeah, hiding out there. Yeah, yeah, because you're creating on the spot, on and the it spot all inside. depends on <laughs> that moment, what the surroundings are, what you what you are feeling inside, and it's it can never be the same. Yeah, yeah. compared to a western where it's sort of a cookie yeah. cutter, hundred times you, it's exactly the same. <laughs> That's all written. It's written. It's decomposed. Exactly. I mean, even between two cycles, like he was saying, right? Even Vilad Khan, when he was going between, in, in one composition, when he was going from one cycle to another, although they had the same rag, same speed, same bandish, same composition, yet no two cycles were alike. <laughs> so four minutes, it's going to be completely different. Yeah, think of it as fractals rather than hexagons. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I don't know what these are. <laughs> <laughs> so Even no scientific terms are being thrown around. There was no two fractals that I did. Yes, yes. <laughs>